So the other day I went to a church and there were a couple of other churches there and I did some training on the Behringer X32 mixing desk and I thought it might be a really helpful video to share with you guys. During the training I just took them through the console and a few of the settings that you might need to know if you are going to be running this console on a Sunday morning. So if you have a Behringer X32 console in your building and you want to know how to get the most out of it, what are some of the things you need to know, and just some of the bits and bobs that you need to know in order to run that console, check this video out and hopefully it will help you. Okay, so this is the X32 training video. Uh, so in this video, I'm gonna just take you through very quickly all the settings on the mixing desk, what they all do, how they all work, all that kind of stuff. So when we come to the mixing desk, I'm gonna assume first of all that uh, you've all got one of these mixing desks and you've been using it and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's going to have a relative amount of settings already in there for you. So what I'm gonna take you through is how we, um, how we alter the things that you would alter on a Sunday morning typically once it's all been kind of initialized and set up from the beginning. So there is a certain flow that we move through the mixing desk. There's a way in which we uh, sort of sequence in which we move through step by step. Um, if anybody's come from the background of analog mixing, this will be fairly logical to you because an analog mixing desk was laid out in the way that the signal passes through a, a mixing desk. If that's not familiar with you, that's absolutely fine. Um, the same thing applies here and we can go through how this all works. So when we first come to the mixing desk, there are a number of things that are worth just kind of orientating yourself around. Um, and this training, we're specifically looking at the Behringer X32 console. And one of the things that's really helpful on this console is that we can uh, access any of these areas by pushing the little view buttons. And all across the mixing desk, you'll see everything lined out with a gray outline around it. And then in the corner, it has a button that says view. And if we push that button, um, what gets pulled up on the screen is the information relating to that particular group of settings. So as we go through all of these sections, we can just pull up that information uh, and see exactly kind of more detail of what's going on within those things as we go through. So the first things that you're gonna to want to be able to do when you come to the mixing desk, um, Depending on your, the way that you use things, you may have to call up a particular scene. Scenes are located here on the right hand side of the desk. You can hit that view button down here and that will pull up uh, your scenes window. Now actually the, the first thing that pulls up here are cues, but we can scroll across the second tab um, to our scenes and from there you can recall a scene and if you do use a Sunday scene a Sunday setting that's how you're going to access that go to your scenes recall the, set, the scene that you need to use and from then on your sort of basic baseline settings will be in place now if you don't use that that's absolutely fine you don't have to do that but that is a way that some churches might might be operating so from there the first place that we're going to head is uh, to our gain settings. So as the sound comes into our mixer, it's going to come in and the first thing it's going to hit is our preamp. Um, now, again, there might be some slight differences here depending on, on your exact setup. In this building here, they've got the digital stage box that goes with this console, which is located up on the stage. And in that instance, the preamps are housed in that stage box. So the preamps are on the stage. If you have an analog stage box and you're running back on an analog stage box into the console, then your preamps are gonna be in the back of the console here. So the console itself has preamps in it um, and you can use those. There's absolutely no problems in using those. If you have the digital stage box though, that's gonna be switched over to using the preamps on the stage. Either way, the control for them is exactly the same. So it doesn't matter what of those two things you're gonna do. Just if, the, again, so at the minute, what I'm looking at here is a, um, a config page. If I need to go back, one of the buttons that's worth knowing is the home page here. And the, that top right hand button up there, you can hit the home page and that's just gonna recall you back to your sort of default layout of screens. So from here, I can start looking at my preamp settings or any of the other settings, as I say, by recalling that view button. 
And we're going to start to look at how are we going to set some of these things. So as I say, first thing we're going to do is we're going to start looking at the preamps. And from here, we've got a couple of controls that relate specifically to our preamps. So up in the very top left-hand corner, you've got a gain control rotary dial, uh, which we can turn up and down. And directly below that, we've got two other buttons. All of these settings here relate to our preamp, and they all give us control over our preamp. So one of the first things that you might need to know is the button that says 48 volts, um, and sometimes we call that phantom power. Phantom power power supply is a way of powering certain pieces of equipment on stage. And if you're not getting sound through, um, it might be because it's something that requires power and isn't currently getting it. So it might be worth just checking that phantom power button. So um, there are certain devices that we use that will require power in order for them to work. So it would be things like a DI box that you would plug through, say, a guitar or a keyboard would go through a DI box. We'll probably need phantom power. It will need some sort of power supply to work. Um, so either it could be phantom power, it could be battery. Some of them will have a battery in them. Normally, um, if you have the option of using phantom power, you would go for that rather than replacing batteries all the time. Um, but it could be either or. The other thing that you might also find that needs phantom power are certain types of microphones. So a condenser microphone is a very common type of microphone that you'll often find that will also require phantom power. So if you're getting no sound, you think you've plugged everything in right, you've checked the cables, but there's still nothing there. It might be that you need to turn the phantom power on. It needs power to, to, to bring that thing to life. Um, and so that's done with the phantom power button. Now, if you're going to turn phantom power on and off, uh, one of the things you just want to be careful of is that that channel isn't sending sound to the speakers because it can make a popping noise as you turn that on and off. So either make sure your channel is muted or make sure the front of house, everything is muted. You can just kill everything over here on your master output and then you know that nothing's going to be sent to the speakers and then we can turn phantom power on. It's worth just checking that if you've got something that, that you think might require phantom is, is whether that's on or off. And that, that will then bring something to life and give you some, some sort of signal there. OK, so second to that then, once we know that we've got some sound coming in, we can then start to check our levels and see whether we can, uh, whether we need to adjust that level, whether it's too loud or too quiet. And so on the screen now, uh, we have here a level indicator You'll see it jumping up and down. As the sound's going through that, you'll see it moving up and down. And that is just showing us how much level we have going into that particular preamp. Now, on this desk, the, the numbers here are all negative numbers. I don't know whether you can see this on the screen, but we've got values. Uh, the first value that we can see here is negative 42. And the highest value we have is negative 2. And then the the very highest point that we have on this is says just says clip. And clip is uh, distortion. Um, for anybody who's not familiar with the term clip, it's just the, you're, you're kind of going beyond what the mixing desk can handle. It's just gone beyond that. That signal can't be processed any longer. Um, and at that point, it just sounds horrible. It'll be distorted. It's just really not very nice. So you want to make sure you avoid clip. Now, when we're dealing with a preamp like this with measurements that are all negative values, the most important thing I would always say is don't worry too much about the signal that you're getting in, but you need to worry about what's called the headroom that you have left, OK? And the headroom is the bit of space beyond the top of your signal to your clip point. So how much space do we have from our signal until we hit clip? And I would be far more concerned about the bit of empty space at the top than I would be about the bit of signal at the bottom. OK, for, for something like this, the, the goal is to just avoid clip and keep it out of that clip space. And so I would be looking at the headroom rather than the signal level. Now, you can do either. You can look at the signal level if you wanted to. But the, the, the point is that you want to make sure you've got that space at the top, your headroom space at the top that you're not going into. And what I would always look to is uh, a figure of an absolute maximum six, uh, sorry, an absolute minimum of six decibels of headroom, OK? Six dB of headroom, which means that your maximum signal wants to be going up to the negative six point. OK, so if your signal is going up to negative six, then you're good. 
If it's going any lower than, than negative six, you might be too quiet and you might need to boost that signal back up. And if it's going above negative six, in theory, you might be okay, but you just need to be careful that you've only got six dB until you hit clip. And the tighter that gets, um, the more kind of, the, the, less, the less wiggle room you have, the less space you have, okay? So I, I would be aiming at that negative six, and that is the loudest points of sound, okay? So that's not an average level. Um, so with a lot of other, if you're, if you're measuring signal, generally you're gonna be looking more of an average level, which is why I say I would be more concerned about the headroom rather than the signal level, because you're not worried about an average particularly. What you're really looking at is those peaks the maximum levels of sound, um, and they're not going above that negative six. Okay, so we can adjust our gain up and down to do that as, as we need to, and we can either use the, the level indicator on the um, screen, or you do also have a level indicator here as well on the side, and that actually does give you a few more values in there. So I've got negative three, negative six, negative nine, negative 12 here. So there's a bit more um, visibility on that, which might also be helpful. Either or, doesn't matter, um, but that's, that's your goal. That's what you're looking at. So think about your headroom. How much space do we have? The third button that we have here that's uh, connected to our preamp is a polarity inversion button. So we can flip polarity on our signal. Now. For some of you, you might be just going, whoa, 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 what, what on earth does that even mean? Um, and if that's the case, it probably actually means that you can just pretty much ignore this button. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things that is really, really useful on some occasions. Um, and if you're in a position where you need that, then you probably know that you need that. And if you don't know that you need it, you probably don't need it. Uh, <laughs> so don't worry too much about polarity phasing. Um, but it's one of the times that you might use it is if you're miking up a drum kit and if you've got, say, two mics on a snare drum, which you might sometimes do, you might mic top and bottom of a snare drum, you're going to want to flip the polarity on one of those two. Like I say, it's going to be one of those situations where if you need it, you know that you need it, and if you don't know that you need it, then don't worry about it. Um, and so for most of the time, check it's off. Again, the one thing that you might find, if somebody's accidentally hit it, you will just, it will just sound very, very weird. Things will just sound like the aliens have taken over and it's all just sounding very strange. Um, and if you're getting that, that might be a time where you just want to check your polarity button and just see whether that's been flipped because it can just cause some weird sounds if you don't need it. Uh, otherwise, don't worry about it, ignore it. It's not, not the end of the world. Okay, so that really is preamps and preamp control and preamp settings. There is here another um, bit that's, that's associated with the preamp. Um, however, I think it's far easier to control that with our EQ. And in a second, I'll, I'll move on to the EQ and we can have a look at that. Um, and I would always deal with this with, uh, within the EQ section. So it's what's called the low cut. And you'll see it, it, it is kind of controlled from up here with the preamp settings. You've got an on and off button to be able to turn that on and off. And then you've got a, a frequency point where we can adjust, turn that up and down. But we'll see that in a lot more detail when we come to looking at EQ in a second. So for the time being, know that it's associated up there with the preamps, but um, actually when we come to controlling it, we'll do that within the EQ. Okay, so our signals come into our mixing desk and it's started its way down the chain through the, the processing within the mixing desk. Now the next area that we actually come to is what we call the dynamic section, which is this section below the preamp here. Once again, we've got a view button and we can push that and that now pulls up the details of that on my screen over here. And we can construct, start to control the dynamics. Now there are two, um, two functions, two bits to this um, that we can control. So there's a gate and there's a, comp a compressor. Now I'm not going to worry too much about gates at this point. I actually, I'm not a big fan of gates. I don't use them all that much. I don't think they're overly helpful. Again, there are some times when they can be useful. But overall, I would rather avoid a gate as much as I can and only use it 
as a sort of, I use it as a way to fix a problem that I can't fix in any other way. So it's, I'll, I'll try every other option first. And if I can't deal with it, anything else, then as a last resort, I'll apply the gate. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it at this point because there's, there's a ton of other stuff that's far more useful to you. Um, so for gates, I, I wouldn't really use them too much. They're, the reason I say that is because they're very, they're very unsubtle. They're very much in your face. Um, so it's a, it's a sound activated switch and it means that your sound will either be on or off and it becomes very, very obvious when it starts clicking on and off and it can cause you all sorts of problems. I can't get sound to come out of my mixing desk because the gate's stopping it from doing it and things like that. So again, it's one of those that don't, don't use it unless you absolutely have to. Compressors, however, are super useful and I would use them all the time. So it's well worth taking a look at a compressor. Now, compressors, um, what a compressor doing? So both of these two things are sound activated devices. Okay, so as I say, a gate is a sound activated switch and it will turn the sound on and off um, when the sound hits a certain level. And the compressor is also a sound activated device. And so we have what we call, in both cases, we have what we call a threshold. And the threshold is we're saying the point at which the sound is loud enough for this effect to take a place. Okay, so in, in regards to a gate, we have our threshold. Anything that's quieter than our threshold is just turned off completely. And when the sound gets loud enough, that gate opens up and the sound then comes out of the speakers. Okay, that's what a gate's doing. Compressor is kind of doing the opposite. Um, so all of our sound is always going out the speakers, but any sound that's going below this point is being unaffected, so it's, the compressor's doing nothing to it. As the sound goes loud enough to go through the threshold, it starts to compress that back down again. And so what we're controlling is how much are we gonna compress that sound once it's passed through the threshold. So we, we can, there are a number of controls that we can adjust with a, within a compressor. And, um, but they're all, they're all going to apply once that sound goes through that, that threshold point, okay? Now, one of the ways that I really like to think about a compressor is it's a tool that helps you pin sound in place. And it's, it's one of the places this makes loads of sense is in terms of a vocal. So with anything we're doing in church, generally the loudest thing that we're always going to have is going to be a vocal. Vocals are going to sit on top of everything. So we want the vocals to be the loudest thing in the worship. We're going to want the vocals to be clear when it's preaching and whatever else is going on. So the vocals are always going to be super important right at the top. And our compressors are just going to help us to pin those things in place. Basically what they're doing is they are um, reducing the dynamic range is what we call it. It's the technical term, which is the, the difference basically by the, between the quietest bits of that sound and the loudest bits of that sound. So how much of a range do we have between the very quietest and the very loudest? And that's what we call the dynamic range. And with a compressor, what we're doing is just to control that dynamic range, probably reduce that dynamic range a little bit and just make it a bit more predictable so we know where it's going to be and then we can put it in the place where we want it to be. Okay, so we just have a bit more control over that sound with our compressors. It will do other things as well. So compressors will change the tone of a sound. So we'll also use them to... Um, to uh, sort of beef something up a little bit. So we'll use it loads on things like a, a bass drum, kick drum. If you want to give that, that bass drum a load of body and kind of make it feel really beefy, uh, compressors will do that. Um, but they, they will just pin things in place and help us to control them that bit more. So they're really, really powerful, really, really useful tool. So when we hit the view button here, um, we, we get presented with a screen with a whole bunch of different controls on it. So we have the first one, as I say, probably the most important one is going to be your threshold. And that's, that's now indicated down here. So I've got a threshold control. Um, and in fact, if we just come along the bottom here, we've got threshold. We then have a ratio. So a ratio is saying um, once we've gone through the threshold and we start to squash that sound back down, how much are we going to squash it down by? So we can have a one to three ratio. So for every uh, every decibel that we go through, we're going to squash it by a third or we're going to squash it by, you know, you can have a one to six or a one to 12 ratio or whatever you're going to use on there. And that, that ratio applies to how much compression are we going to apply to that thing. Next control we have along is attack. And the attack is saying how quickly after it goes through the threshold are we going to start to compress it down. 
So we can, we can have that slightly longer or slightly shorter, depending on what the thing is. Next control we have is hold. So that's, it goes through the, through the threshold. How quickly do we attack it? How quickly do we start to pull it down? Once we've started to pull down, how long do we hold that thing down? That's our hold setting. And then the, the next one along is release. So it goes through the threshold, we start to squash it down, we hold it down, and then how long until we let it go back out again? Okay, so that's attack, hold, and release. And then the last one here is we have gain. And one of the things we try to do with the compressor is we say, well, if we're gonna squeeze the top down with, um, with this compressor, we want to then boost that back up again so that we don't lose volume by compressing it all down. We actually, we take the peaks down, but then we shift all of that up so that the loudest bits are still as loud as the loudest bits were before. Um, and instead of just making everything quieter, we can boost that back up again so it stays at a consistent level. And one of the things, one of the tools that you would want to use is the, the compressor on and off button over here. Um, and what you can do is you, when we come to setting that gain, once we start to apply some compression to this sound, we can turn the compressor on and off and say, is this jumping in volume? If I turn the compressor on, does it suddenly get really quiet? And if I turn the compressor off, does it suddenly get really loud again? In which case, our gain settings are not right and we can change that gain. And what we wanna try and do is to make it not change in volume as we turn that compressor on and off, okay? So, Back onto the screen here, those are the controls that we have for, for the compressor, but what we actually see up here is a kind of graph. And what we have is a line that goes up at sort of 45 degrees to a certain point where it then starts to change that angle, okay? And so what we're saying is um, the threshold is the point at which that signal will start to change, okay? The ratio will be indicated by the angle of that graph. So the, the higher the ratio, the steeper that, that compression will be. The less the ratio, the, the more linear it will be. Uh, you won't see represented the attack and the release. Those things will be just um, heard rather than seen on this graph. But then the other thing that you will see is the makeup gain afterwards and that gain level will then kind of push that graph up and down, the whole graph will start to shift up and down on this um, image here in front of you. And just to the right of that graph, we actually have another level indicator, but this one is a negative le level indicator. So the one to the left will go from the bottom up and the one to the right here will go from the top down. And what that's saying is how many decibels are we reducing our signal by once it's gone through the compressor? Okay, so you might see six dB coming off that signal as it goes through the compressor. And that can give you an indication as to how much gain we need to add back on the other end. If we're taking out six dB on the compressor, then we need to boost it back up again by six dB to come out the other side. Um, Unlike before where we were looking at our peak level uh, on, our, on our input on the preamp, we were looking at the peak and the maximum level. Here we're actually looking at an average level. So it will fluctuate. So you will find that at some points, if somebody really, if we look at a kick drum, somebody really hits that drum hard, it might take 12 dB off. Um, but then if they hit it a bit softer, it might only take 3 dB off. So there will be a kind of average fluctuation. So it's not that you can just say, well, we, I hit 12 dB when they hit that kick drum, therefore I want to put 12 dB gain back on it. Um, there will be some fluctuations in this. This will, will vary a lot more than it did on the preamp. So it's going to be more of an average than a fixed level, okay? But compressors, super, super helpful and really worth having a look at those and, and trying to start to get your head around those a bit and just, just start to play with them. If you, if you start to look at a 6 dB reduction on your compressor. If you can see 6 dB coming off your sound, that's relatively subtle. And that's, that's the point that you could start to say, well, we could start to apply a compressor, just start to play with it a little bit, just start to have a bit of a, an experiment with this without having too drastic of an effect. So if you see it just kind of knocking down by 6 dB, um, that's the point where you'd probably just start to hear it and 
it's not going to be too drastic if you start to play with, with that kind of level of compression. But once you get into it, you can really compress things a lot more than that. And once you're more confident with it, feel free to go beyond that. OK, so compression and uh, dynamics, that's the next section that we go through from there. The signal moves on to what's actually the biggest chunk of the, uh, the layout of the screen here. We've got the equalization and the EQ, another really, really key part of mixing sound and something, again, that you really want to get your head around this. Again, we can hit the view button, and again, it will pull up a nice little graph for us to have a look at here in front of us. Now, on this... Um, desk we have a four band parametric equalizer okay and that means that we've got four sets of controls here if you like high high mid low mid and low indicated here by the four buttons down this side and they are four fully independent parts that we can control okay and a parametric equalizer is a type of equalizer which has quite a significant amount of control to it, okay? We've got three things that we can change on our um, parametric EQ. Now, for the time being, I'm just gonna take that off just so we can see this a bit more clearly. If we look at the second um, band, which is our low mid band here, indicated with a nice little yellow box around here, I can show you the, the kind of control that we can have over this particular band. So the first thing that we can do is we can turn that band up and down, okay? So we can have more of that particular frequency or less of that particular frequency, and we can adjust that, okay? The second thing that we can choose is we can choose what specific frequency we're going to be listening to. So we can sweep it down. So these will be lower frequencies down here. This would actually be very, very low frequencies down this far down. Um, we can go into low mids towards the mids, high mids, and right up to the high frequencies all the way up there. My arm's probably blocking that a little bit, but there you go. So you can see that moving up and down, and we can choose exactly what frequency we want to start adjusting, okay? And then the third thing that we can control is the Q control, and Q is about the width of that curve. So if I adjust this up and down, so we can make it very, very narrow, real pinpoint frequency that we can select, or we can make a really wide sweeping band, so we can choose a broad chunk of frequencies to adjust, and we can choose exactly how much of that we want to control. So for example, if we had a feedback problem and there was just one particular frequency that was feeding back, we can make it super narrow, just dial in that one frequency. And we're, we're not, like particularly if that's a, a vocal, we don't want to chop out loads of that vocal. We want to have as much of that vocal sound as possible. We just want to get rid of that one problem feedback frequency, make it super narrow and just pinpoint that one frequency and notch it out. So it's a very flexible tool. And we can do this with um, all of these bands. So we can have high, high mid, low mid, and low, and they all have that same control on them. Except the high and the low, which actually have even more control over that than that over them. So the high band here, we actually now have another set of controls which we can control, which are done over here with the mode button. And here with the mode button, I can actually choose exactly what shape I want that curve to be. So I can choose whether it's the, the bell curve shape that we just had a minute ago. Um, there are two kind of variations of that bell curve, most basically doing much the same sort of thing, really. You can then have the ability to just take a, a shelf. Um, so that could be boosting high frequencies or cutting all of the high frequencies. And if I pull that down, you'll just see it's just taking out everything above a certain point or boosting everything above a certain point. Okay, so that's your shelf control or what it just calls a high cut. So with a high cut, I can only cut, I can't now turn that up, but I can just chop out a chunk of frequencies above a certain point if we wanted to. So there's, you can even change the shape of that curve if you wanted to as well. And you can do the same on the low um, curve as well. So you can do that there. However, this is where we come back to what we did at the preamp, the low cut control that we had, okay? So I can, I can make my low band here a low cut, one option, you could do it that way. But in my opinion, you are effectively wasting that band of that parametric because we can do exactly that same thing 
um, using the low cut here. And if we apply that low cut, we have a dedicated, effectively you have a fifth, fifth band of your parametric here that we can now start to control. Um, and this is why I would treat it as part of your equalization rather than um, anything else, because A, you've got a nice visual graph here that shows us exactly what that's doing, and B, it, you can use it to free up that low band EQ um, point as well and just create an extra band for you here so we can clean up that low frequencies by pulling up that low band there. Um, and then we're free then with the low frequencies to, to take another notch in there if we wanted to as well. So we've got even more control over that. So super powerful. Um, one of the things that I really like about the X32 is that it actually gives you what's called a spectrograph, which is um, if you've got sound coming through here, it'll actually show you uh, on here the, the frequencies that are being used. And you may have seen this on your desk, but you'll see um, points of sound that hop up here and at the time when this becomes really, really useful is when you've got feedback. And if there is a frequency that's feeding back, you'll see it really clearly. It will show a, it's like a bar graph and it will show you a particular bar at a certain point, um, which is feeding back. And all you need to do is line up your EQ with that bar, make it super narrow and pull it out. And you can, you can just line those two things up, drop it straight out and, and get rid of that. So it's really handy for that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's well worth just having a look at that. Um, cause it, yeah, it's, it's a very powerful tool to be able to do that. I would say that's the one time, uh, that's, the, that's the one time that I would use it. The rest of the time, I would actually not worry too much about the spectrograph on there because um, so much of setting the EQ is far more about what you hear. And I think one of the downsides of the spectrograph is that it actually you can rely on your eyes more than your ears. And you will look at this and you'll see, oh, it looks like the bass is really loud. And you'll then start to build your EQ based off what you're seeing rather than what you're hearing. And when it comes to shaping the tone of the sound, which is what we're doing here, uh, you're going to be far better off using your ears and listening to what you can hear and changing the sound based off what you hear and what's kind of happening in the room and even what's happening on stage, how the instruments are all interacting with each other rather than what you see with your eyes. So the only time I'd, I would look at that spectrograph <coughs> is when it comes to feedback and, and just reducing feedback problems. The rest of the time, use your ears. Don't, don't get drawn into just looking at that scope and seeing how that, that's going with your eyes. So equalization, as I say, very powerful, really, really useful. You definitely want to be using that and you definitely want to be changing that every week. You're going to be wanting to make tweaks to that on a, on a Sunday morning. So get in the habit of, of having a look at that and having a play with that. Again, maybe you just want to start off making some subtle changes, but um, the more you get into it, the more familiar you get with it, the more helpful that will become to you. OK, so that's, that's the majority of the control um, that you would want to tweak and adjust for setting sound on this console. From that point, we can start to push some faders up and we can start to bring some sound into the, the speakers and start to set some levels and mix our band instruments against each other and that kind of thing. As I say, we're going to make sure that the vocals are on the top of that mix, the loudest part of that mix, and then just start to shape the other things around that. The other buttons that we have coming down here, I'll just point these out. So you've got a select button. So one of the things you might have noticed is that we only have one set of controls. Again, if you've come from an analog world, you will know that we have uh, a base low frequency control for every single channel. So if you've got a 20 channel desk, you'll have 20 low frequency controls. Here, I've only got one low frequency control. Okay. So in order to choose which of the channels we're going to be adjusting. That's where we use our select button. So if I want to adjust this one, I hit the select there. And now I'm controlling that one. So anything that you're controlling up here is going to be uh, selected via that, that first button as we come down the, the channel strip. Solo is the next button that we come to down here. And solo, uh, Basically, the main, main purpose of that is to put it into your headphones. So you can plug a pair of headphones in here. And if you just want to listen to that one channel, uh, you can hit that solo button. And that's now going to be coming into your headphones. It can be useful at times to be able to do that. Um, 
uh, I will quite often use that if you've got, say, two guitarists on stage and you're saying, well, I can hear there's two guitars, but I'm not quite sure which of them's playing lead and which of them's playing rhythm. Solo them, listen to your headphones. Oh, yeah, he's the one who's playing the lead part. Great, OK, now I know what to do with that. That's the kind of thing you'd do with your headphones. One, one point, actually, is to never make uh, never make any major changes through your headphones. Ideally, you don't want to make any changes through your headphones. You always want to make changes based off what you can hear from the speakers. If you mix all your sound on headphones, then the only person it's going to sound for, good for is going to be yourself on those headphones. And um, we are always going to want to mix for the congregation in the room. So we want to listen to the same thing that the congregation are listening. Ideally, you want to be as close to the congregation as you possibly can be, hearing the same sound as the congregation are going to be hearing. Uh, if, if anybody ever says to me, can we stick the PA desk in the balcony? I would say no, uh, because you want to be mixing for the congregation. You don't want to be mixing for yourself sat in the balcony. You can have the best sound in the world up there on the balcony, and the congregation down here are all holding their ears and complaining they can't hear anything. So, Always make sure you're mixing for the congregation. So again, don't be tricked. If you're pushing the solo button, don't plug your headphones in and start EQing the guitar based off what you can hear on your headphones. Listen to how it sounds in the room. Final button is the mute button. Hopefully it's fairly self-explanatory. You're going to just turn that sound on and off, kill that one. Um, fairly simple. Actually, again, I'm, I'm not, generally, I'm not a massive fan of mutes for much the same reason why I'm not a massive fan of gates, because it's just very unsubtle. If you have a channel muted, and then somebody gets up and starts speaking to the microphone, and you miss it, and then you unmute it, and suddenly it comes blaring out, it, there's nothing subtle about a mute button. I would always say push the fader down, and if you miss it, you can just fade that subtly back in again, much, much smoother than suddenly unmuting a channel. Um, the only time that I'd say it's fine to mute a channel is like now where we've got nothing on the stage and I don't need to worry about suddenly I'm muting things. No problem in having things muted at this point. But mid-service, I would avoid muting things, generally speaking, unless you're, you're absolutely laser focused and you're really on it and you can unmute those before people are on those, those channels. But do yourself a favor and don't use the mute buttons. Okay, and then, then we're down to the faders and you push a fader up and it gets louder, pull it down, it gets quieter again, hopefully fairly self-explanatory. Okay, so we've now got to a point where we've got sound coming out of our speakers. Now, the next thing we will move on to in a second is how we route it to other things, so stage monitors and, and that sort of stuff. But just before we do, there might be um, a couple of other things that you need to be aware of depending on your situation and depending on what you're wanting to do. One of them, fairly fun one in many respects, is what, what's called the scribble strip on, um, on the Behringer consoles. I've got a few confused faces here. So I can take you through the, the scribble strip on a, on a Behringer desk. The scribble strip is this little uh, row of indicators here that you can label and you can change colors and you can do all sorts of fun things with. And to get to it, we're going to go to Setup. And then we're going to use the Page Select to move along. Oh, I've realized maybe this is the reason why some of you are looking a bit blank. In the latest firmware update, they've actually changed the name. So this was, they, they used to call this the, the scribble strip. It's now called Name Slash Icon. Far less fun name. Uh, I think it was far better calling it the scribble strip. So uh, in here, we can control a number of things associated to that, that nice little panel there that tells us what's going on. So you've got the ability to change the color of something, so you can select what color it is. And it's quite handy to be able to group um, things together. So you could say, if you've got multiple microphones on a drum kit, you could group all those one color, so you know the drum kit's always yellow, and the vocal mics are always red or whatever it's going to be and you can use it to group certain channels together so you can visually see quite quickly where things are. The next thing you've got is a whole bunch of little icons and you can choose so if you've got a kick drum channel you can choose the little kick drum icon or whatever else there are loads of them down here scroll through and see if you can find something that you seems appropriate for what you're trying to do. And then uh, it the next one is the name. And again, it does give you a whole bunch of preset names that you can just recall. And I don't know if you've ever seen this, but if you scroll all the way down, uh, you will find 
Ian, Jan, Lisa, Shirley, Jerry, Brunella, a whole bunch of names. If you've got any of those people in your church, then great. Or you can just rename your church band if you want to and uh, give them new names based on the ones that are in there. However, if you can't find something in the defaults that you want, you can just go in and manually edit it. Now, one of the things, uh, slight downside of the X32 is it's not a touch screen, so I can't just hit the buttons on here. This is one of the places where actually it's, it can be worth getting the app set up on something like an iPad or a phone because naming things can be so much quicker if you've got a proper keyboard and you can type things in. I would quite often set this kind of stuff on, a, on an iPad or something. If you had to do it on here, you can do it. And it's, it's not too bad. Again, it is something they've improved actually with this firmware that you can scroll side to side with one control and up and down on the other to, to get to letters a lot quicker. So all of that can be done in here. So if you need to rename a channel, that's where you're gonna do it, in here. The other thing that can also be known, so we went to set up, I'm gonna hit the home page, it's gonna take us back to where we started off again before. The other thing that can be quite useful to know is um, if you, again, tab along on the pages to the config page, we actually also have the ability here to be able to choose which input we're gonna be looking at for this particular channel. And this, I'm not gonna to do too much on this because this can get really confusing, but with digital mixing, one of the, the um, it's, it's a bit of a two-edged sword. One of the great things, but also one of the slightly more confusing things is just because you plug something into input number one doesn't mean it has to appear on channel number one, okay? And we can, so, Ordinarily, a mixer will be set up in what we call a one-to-one -one patch, which just means that input one is patched to channel one, input two to channel two, three to three, four to four, five to five, etc. Uh, but you do have the ability to be able to change that. And you can say, so I've selected here input number nine, but I can actually say I want it to take its feed from input number one. And I can plug a microphone into input number one and have it appear here on channel number nine. And there's a few reasons why you might want to do that. Uh, so you might want to do what's called parallel processing. So I could say I've got channel nine here, taking its input from input number one. And if I go to number 10, I also want number 10 to also take its input from channel number one. So I've got, say, one guitar plugged into one input being processed on two separate channels. And what we can do is we can create stereo effects. So we can take a guitar, one guitar, pan it left and right, EQ it slightly different from left to right, put a reverb on one side and a delay on the other or something like that and you can create sort of massive guitar sounds just by doing this kind of thing. So it's one way that you can use it. Or another thing that you could do with it is to, depending on the setup, if you have a stage box one side of the stage, for example, and then um, two stage boxes, one either side of the stage, Right, let's go with that. And we say, right, well, my keyboard's on this side and I want to be able to plug it into that stage box and my guitar's on that side and I want to be able to plug it into that side stage box. Just because this is on this side and plugged into that stage box doesn't mean it has to appear on certain channels. You can then reroute those to different places if you want to back on your console, okay? Like I say, it can get really confusing. So again, if it's not something you need to worry about, generally, if you can stick to one-to-one -one patching, it will make life far less confusing for you, but there are times when you might not want to, and this is how you'd get to that. Okay, so we've got sound, we've got channels, we've labeled them all up, we've got our gain set, we've got our EQ set, we've done our compression, we've done all of that stuff. We've got sound coming out of the speakers, but now our band wants some monitors. How are we gonna go about sending them the audio to that? Now, there's a couple of ways that we can send audio to monitors from this console. I'm, for the time being, we're, I know we're kind of running out of time a little bit, so I'm gonna just send you, say, uh, give you one way to do this, and I would say this is my preferred way to do this, but this is just personal preference, and if you've got an alternative way that you know of, then fine, there's no problems with that. The way that I would do it, so we're gonna go here to our buses, and I'm gonna start looking at buses one to eight. Uh, buses is just another term for outputs, and it's just a way that we send sound out of the des desk. So we've got um, main left and right over here is a bus. Main left and right bus is main output. Uh, and then buses one to eight here would effectively be monitors one to eight on the stage that you could plug in. Now, if I select 
bus number one. In this instance, that's labeled as Nord. Nord is the keyboard on the stage, so that's whoever sat at that keyboard on stage. I can select that monitor. And right next to it, we've got this button here that says sends on faders. And if we push this, you'll see all the faders here all move. And what we're now doing is this set of faders, rather than sending sound to the speakers, this is now sending sound to that monitor. So exactly the same way as we would have sent sound to those speakers, we push the faders up and whatever faders we push up here will go to that monitor, okay? And if I now take sends on faders off, the faders will all jump back and I'm now looking at the speakers again. So this is now what the congregation are gonna hear. And this time, uh, the drums here want to change their monitors, so we select the drum monitors, sends on faders, and now these are all going to be related to drums. We can make our changes for the drums. And then keyboard player says, actually, can we make some more changes to the keyboard so we can flick back to that bus? And we're now looking at what we're sending to that particular keyboard, okay? So this is sends on faders. Any of those buses that we select, whatever we do on the left hand side on this bank of faders over here is being sent to the bus that we've got selected on this side over here now really important thing if you're going to use sends on faders always make sure you turn it off as soon as you've finished with it the number of times i've made changes to a monitor left it and then you want to change something in front of house and you can't change it and oh why is it not working and then you realize that you've just completely messed up that monitor mix um every time so as soon as you made your changes turn it off again <laughs> and get it, get yourself out of there otherwise it, yeah, you, you'll soon get yourself in in a pickle okay um so yeah that that's how we're going to get all of the sound out of the console I think I think at this point let's do let's let's stop there. We'll, we'll stop at this point and uh, we'll come on to some more stuff in a little while. But yeah, let's let's leave it there for now. Okay, thank you. So that's it. I hope that's been helpful for you. If it has, please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit that little bell icon so you get notified about more content and consider the thumbs up as well. That would be great. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.